I would like to introduce the uh, executive director of the South Mountain Partnership, Katie Hess, to get up and make a few introductory remarks and uh, start things rocking and rolling. I'm Katie Hess. I'm the director of the South Mountain Partnership. And also, I serve as the Pennsylvania Director of Landscape Conservation for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy in uh, Pennsylvania. I started that role about two years ago. Um, this Science Summit is almost a decade in the making. The concept of it was developed by my predecessor, John Peterson, who is now working for the Network for Large Landscape Conservation, which is an organization that is helping um, landscape conservations across North America to develop best practices and tools and information to improve the way that we work with our communities. Um, so they envisioned that this uh, research core and science summit as a way to reveal to more people the decades of research that has been happening in this landscape, both in Michaux State Forests and our state parks, but also outside of those DCNR boundaries. And by revealing and giving access to that research, we're hoping to you know, better empower landowners and land managers, but also other types of community leaders like our county planning departments, municipal planners, and people who are making decisions about the health of our future moving forward. Um, central in that concept is student experience and students getting involved in that research because obviously they are the future. And there's no better way to create future stewards of landscape resources than to involve them in research about a, the place where they are in and get them interested in that place. Uh, the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources of the common people, common property of the people, including generations yet to come. As trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. But they have a lot of meaning. Uh, that means the public natural resource agencies like DCNR are obligated to meet the requirements of this constitution and to make these natural resources available and understandable for the citizens of Pennsylvania. You know, how can we possibly conserve the natural resources or the historic resources? How can we make them available for generations yet to come if we don't even understand them? And if we don't, uh, if we don't have the information to manage them properly, if we don't take care of them and really bring the stories out for this generation and future generations. However, those of you who have chosen to dig deep, um, I really respect and applaud and bringing your findings to the table like this for the rest of us to learn from helps the natural resource agency that the stewards of these resources that manage them better, manage them for the future for generations yet to come, pull out these stories so they're understood by all and engage, as Katie said, you know, engage the next generation in this work. Sally Jewell, uh, Obama's head of the Department of Interior, used to say, conservation is a forever business. So this broad partnership here at South Mountain is critical. You're the citizens and the scientists and the institutions that will carry this work forward. Uh, as I'm sure everybody has heard that outdoor recreation, particularly since the pandemic, has become really popular. And in a report from the Outdoor Foundation, um, they were recording about a 5% uh, increase in the numbers of individuals uh, engaging in outdoor recreation between uh, 2007 and 2015, and then saw an uptick after 2015, um, recording about 11.8% increase in 2020, so a big uptake in the number of people engaging in outdoor recreational activities. And if you look between the years of, uh, between May 2018 and May 2019, there was a, a almost 30% increase in the number of individuals. What activities are people engaging in that are now going out and enjoying our great outdoor environment that we have? And so biking in general is one of those uh, activities that people are engaging in more as they're getting out and participating in outdoor recreation. Specifically, 40% uh, of all visitor use to uh, Michaud is considered non-motorized and non-consumptive. 
Um, and mountain biking is the second highest non-motorized activity uh, for those that are coming to Michaud. And eight, about just over 8% reported that that was their primary reason for visiting Michaud State Forest was to go and engage in mountain biking. In having conversations uh, with, um, with Matt Pachowski when he was the recreational forester for Michaud State University, he said that there was some concern in how some of these activities, they needed a better understanding of how these activities were uh, affecting um, the environment and specifically water quality. And they noticed that there was a lot of use of what they were calling authorized and unauthorized trails, or basically DCNR maintained trails versus user created trails. The question was, what are the ecological impacts associated with this increased mountain bike activity? And doing a little bit of a, some literature research, past uh, studies have found that vegetation removal and erosion um, due to mountain biking use is really not any different than a hiking trail. Where are the quarries? Why are they there? What are we seeing at the sites? And how are we protecting them? Here you can see uh, South Mountain landscape. This is a landscape we're having to deal with. If you're unfamiliar with rhyolite, which is surprising if you are, but if you are unfamiliar with rhyolite, it is a high silica volcanic rock that's been used by indigenous populations for tool making for thousands of years. It was uh, widely traded and it is uh, available on South Mountain. So it's an important uh, local and regional resource. When you have a landscape that looks like this, finding these pits gets really challenging. So we needed a different way. And that way is using the latest generation of LIDAR data. If you're not familiar with LIDAR, it's just sending light pulses uh, from the bottom of a plane and it gives us elevational data. And so what we are doing now is using that LIDAR data to give us um, new information about the landscape. Specifically, we can compare a location to areas around it relative to their elevations. So you can see a, a road here, there's another road here, some old stone fencing, charcoal platforms here. <clears throat> what you don't see there uh, are, are quarries, they're there. Over 1,500 individual pits were mapped. There's clearly more than that, but those are the ones that we mapped. They occur in roughly four groups, most in the north, but uh, some scattered groups in the far southern extent of the Michelle. And because we've mapped the individual pits, now we have in information on each of those pits, so we can map things like pit volume, pit width, et cetera, et cetera. That's uh, an artifact collector or looter's uh, pit at a, uh, at a workshop site in the protected area. It's kind of uh, sad to see that. This is nothing new. This has been going on for generations, people going out and collecting artifacts. Unfortunately, you know, once it's dug, it can't be undug. And so the knowledge that would have been there is, 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 completely, is completely lost. How do you keep this from happening? Well, I think it's the same way that you would, you keep big game hunters don't hunt in a zoo, right? I mean, it's a zoo. It's, let's make this an archeological zoo. Let's, let's put signage up there. And that way when people go out there, they're gonna be a lot less likely uh, to disturb it. And so John Waugh has been working on, on this with others, with, uh, with Joe and with uh, the South Mountain Partnership have been going out and they've been putting up signs and hopefully at some point we'll get interpretive signs uh, out there as well. This is a, a, a photo of Ebert Spring and uh, it was our initial focus to um, start to consider uh, effects of the surrounding land use, particularly you know the increase in impervious surfaces from all the warehousing and, uh, and other development uh, in the region. Uh, and then it evolved out into some other springs that, that I've been studying for a long time. Before we uh, get into those details, we'll sort of set the, the context here uh, with South Mountain being really the recharge area uh, hydrologically for uh, the springs of the Cumberland Valley. And uh, that is um, 
you know, be, the, the importance of that, I, I don't think, can be, can be overstated. Uh, this particular uh, cartoon is from, um, uh, from a well-known German uh, researcher in, in uh, karst hydrogeology. When I say karst, that is uh, based on carbonate geology of limestone, of uh, dolomites that are, that are uh, you know, th they'll dissolve if um, in contact with, with a natural acid or, or other acids. Uh, and so this um, nicely demonstrates, I think it's one of my favorite sort of teaching figures, um, the um, vulnerability of these environments. And Shippensburg University sits right atop uh, this, of course. You'll get some, some you know, depressions at depth. You'll get uh, vernal pools. Um, you'll get swallow holes in the streams. And it just really illustrates the importance of, uh, of the South Mountain region for, um, for, for groundwater recharge uh, in, in our area. For 20 years, I've been thinking about this and uh, thinking we, we really have to protect our water quality based on what is happening up gradient in these karst areas because of the, um, the patterns that, that exist of, of this beautiful water from South Mountain, uh, but then sinking uh, early on um, to different degrees, you know, as it crosses the valley on its way uh, to, to the Susquehanna. For Spring Creeks in the region, um, these are conduits basically for uh, surface contaminants uh, to the Susquehanna and Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so I think, you know, these studies that, are, that our students have helped with have, have uh, really increased my own understanding of these things and, and um, helped us to, um, to, to really figure out, you know, how, how should we, how should we um, you know, focus on these problems? What should we do about them? I'm going to start out with the how I use LIDAR, how I use LIDAR in locating historic air and industry features, and uh, record, how I record the data on Harfs and Collier Huts, a couple configurations of Collier Huts, because they're all different, and Collier Hut features. This is an index map that I created. Now on the right, I guess it's hard to see, but there's a map number, and then the name I gave each map and how many harps and color huts are on each map. So I came up with a figure of 7,662 charcoal harps and 210 color huts that show up on LIDAR. So I field verified 843 and 90 color huts. And those last two numbers, they change every month as I hike. So currently I'm at 853 and 94 huts. Uh, just two weeks ago, I found three Collier huts, and it took me 15 minutes to find them. So there's, on this particular map, there's 707 harfs, and I field verified 278, and the Collier huts are 29 and 22. And all the other maps are similar to this. And this is the LIDAR map that I used to create the previous slide. And between using the computer and a paper printout, I could locate the charcoal harps and the color huts. Uh, the smallest one, I think, is 16 feet, and the largest is huge at 50 feet. And I also take two dimensions of the hearth, one from the bottom of the cut which is there out to the edge of the fill, and then one from the transition. Um, both those dimensions are different. Um, it's the transition length is just a little bit larger than the, than the cut to the fill, which is unusual. So I'm a wildlife biologist with the Bureau of Forestry, and I am based out of the Harrisburg office, but I do like to come and visit the Michaud uh, and have been working for years now, uh, helping to monitor the rattlesnake population. And um, if you're not familiar with our state forest system, we have 20 state forest districts and over 2 million acres of land that we manage. So we have a lot of, a lot of land. So to get started with rattlesnakes, um, they've been a symbol uh, of our nation in the Revolutionary War, this flag is familiar now, more modern times, another you know, political group is using this flag uh, for their purposes, but it basically is, is saying to Great Britain in the early 1700s, 
Um, if you poke us, we're going to bite you. What we have um, now, as the nation um, in, and has been pioneered in North, in North America, the pioneers and Europeans are moving in. And um, a lot of wildlife is being you know, exploited. And there's not uh, as much, um, there's no regulation. It's every man for himself. And a lot of these species suffer. You know, the, the, the wolf, even the deer, and the beaver were pretty much extirpated from Pennsylvania. And the passenger pigeon, of course, is extinct. So that's why organizations like the Game Commission were formed to help bring back deer and to regulate uh, the take of these, these species. And similarly, the Fish and Boat Commission, if you didn't know that, that they're not just for fish, but they also regulate um, reptiles and amphibians. And um, as a person working for DCNR, I help to work closely with those biologists and to manage uh, species like uh, the timber rattlesnake on state forest land. So this is a distribution in North America of the timber rattlesnake. It's um, in Pennsylvania, you can see it's a pretty big stronghold right there, M more so up in the north central part of the state, which I'll get into. So right now, um, it's actually not doing so well throughout its range, and it's actually gone in certain parts of its range. But around us, you'll see a lot of the states are, it's listed as either threatened or endangered. The Fish and Boat Commission was trying to figure out what to do with this species. And uh, because it was listed as a, uh, in Pennsylvania, it was listed as a candidate rare. So it was kind of in limbo determining whether or not it should be listed as threatened or endangered. So what we, we needed to do in the state was do an assessment. And there, cause there were a lot of records on paper from where people had seen them in the past. And uh, so the first thing to do was do a statewide assessment, uh, get people out there mapping these new these sites, putting them in the GIS formats, and then assessing the condition of each site and uh, looking where we might need to do some management and then develop some working group to determine the, the status after all the information came in. Um, so what we did in 2016 was with all that information, uh, it was lit, determined that the timber rattlesnake in Pennsylvania is actually doing pretty well over most of its range. So it was delisted. So it's no longer listed as candidate rare. It's totally delisted species at this point. So there are some safeguards in place to make sure that, like I said, the rattlesnake stays in high numbers. And so what Fish and Boat does is they regulate it as more or less a game species. If you hiked on the South Mountain, You've been in these rocky areas, and that's where you go, oh, that's really snaky. OK. So that, that, that is a good place to look. And so we kind of categorize that habitat into two basic critical habitat areas. And one is the rattlesnake den. And when, you, when I say den, I'm talking about an overwintering area. And then there's the other rock habitat, which is the basking habitat. They're just or the gestation areas where they shed after they come out of hibernation. So what's next? But anyway, that study is, it's, I'm just throwing it out there, as, if anyone's interested in doing it. The far side, that guy, he just was, he was great. Um, I mean, I miss Gary Larson a lot. But um, it's to continue DCNR Fish and Boat Commission partnerships and ongoing efforts. We want to assess and monitor sites on a regular basis uh, looking at, you know, prioritizing where we, we do our burns and timber sales, trails, and uh, of course there's other species to concern that the district is concerned with, not just timber rattlesnakes. So, um, but to establish a monitoring sites, you know, with, for fishing boat or with East Stroudsburg University, like permanent monitoring sites that we monitor, and to try to write our management plans at a landscape level that the district can use when they're doing their management and uh, form new partnerships with the universities uh, to do this research or the friends groups to help monitor. We are going to be talking about um, research that's been ongoing at um, Camp Show, as well as some recent developments in terms of the management both of the archaeological site and the forest itself. Um, and I would say kind of a 
I think what's turning into pretty awesome collaborations between different um, institutions here in central Pennsylvania and the South Mountain. Anyway, the first sort of historical recorded use of this place, obviously indigenous people were using this area well before Europeans arrived. Um, we have found probably one like flake of a lithic tool. Which I've, I was hoping to maybe find a little bit more out here, but um, no such luck. So we're just gonna focus on the historic periods here. Um, it's sort of first known as the Bunker Hill Farm um, between around 1787 and 1919. Um, and the barn wall that used to look like this when we started working out there has sadly um, pretty much mostly collapsed now. Um, but some of the foundation of the farmhouse is still there um, and possibly more of it. Um, and this farm seems to primarily have been producing food for the pine grown iron furnace. After its use as a farm, um, as you know, most of this whole area was deforested to produce fuel for the pine grove furnace. Um, and so in the 1930s, when um, the, uh, the, we were putting people back to work as part of the Civilian Conservation Corps, this was one of the first camps in the United States. Basically, they built um, kind of an army style barracks for these young men to give them some work and reforest these areas that had been kind of depleted of their trees um, during the iron furnace uh, industry era. Then World War II began and they converted this area that already was sort of a barrack-like place into a POW camp. It held mostly German prisoners of war and it was sort of um, the work that Emily Masters has done for her master's uh, research, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, it looks like an area where they would kind of bring in soldiers, um, kind of suss out what their role actually was um, in the German military and then send them off to different places depending on sort of their level of intelligence, if you will. Um, it did hold some Japanese prisoners of war right at the end of the war. Um, I believe this is a picture of that encampment there. Um, so fascinating history. The wall that you saw earlier um, from the barn has collapsed and now this last part collapsed in 2012. And one of the um, sill timbers that was in the barn actually was then loosened. So park staff had gone in, um, for staff, and uh, collected that timber and put it in a climate controlled area. So uh, what ended up happening was this timber, the whole thing was mailed to Cornell University. Um, they have a tree ring laboratory, likely fell date of 1825, um, which again reflects when this was used as a sill timber in the barn, but it might not have been the original one. So I, I work for SCA, um, but the outdoor core crews that um, DCNR has are filled with a Student Conservation Association um, students, employees. Uh, so we're the cultural resources crew. Um, we're actually going up and spending the next month at Penn Roosevelt um, in and around State College. So we'll do metal detecting, we'll do some mapping that isn't just based on um, the information that we have from aerials and existing maps, but we're gonna go out and kind of ground truth those, see if there are any additional ones um, that need to be mapped. As she says, again, for South Mountain specifically, um, compliance-related consultation, um, bringing into the process projects that have been going on and new projects, but bringing that cultural resources side into it bringing proper awareness to um, artifacts, sites, um, areas of sensitivity that should be addressed as part of those projects. For you know, state property, those artifacts do belong to that park, to that state agency. Um, so if you find things, usually it's best to leave it in place and let someone know or map it and get that information. Um, if you were to pick up artifacts from a state property, they ultimately should go back to that state agency. Um, but if you have information on exactly where you found it, that's usually the best thing, um, whether you've picked it up or ideally if you've left it in the ground, because um, that's information that you know, you're out, you see it, but maybe not other people really get to see that. So it's information that we can't always gather on our own. Um, and then also supporting ongoing and community-based collaboration. So we're not just going through projects like you might have at CRM firms, you know, the point is educating, point is bringing people together and bringing a more holistic understanding of cultural resources, especially in combination with, um, you know, DCNR projects. Leetort is a limestone legacy. So it was a place that we knew we had to secure and protect the headwaters of Leetort Spring Run, a former watercress farm, when we had the opportunity. As a land trust, we buy 
former farms and forests sometimes. Sometimes we hold on to those as preserves as we did in this case. Sometimes we pass them off to better caretakers with Bureau of Forestry, for example. And other times we work out conservation easements. Right here we are along the Leechwort Spring Run, really Carlisle or at Cumberland County's Central Park. It was the center of, of a lot of things, including the, uh, the American frontier in the, 17, in the early 1700s. The Watercrest Farm is at the headwaters, where, like at Boiling Springs, all of this underwater, underground water, right, deep in the aquifer, sometimes thousands of years, comes to the surface in a series of little springs and, and big wetland seeps. We bought 60 acres there, and it is a place of special beauty and global esteem. Uh, these are the former watercress beds, which harbored and then released a native dormant seed bank of wetland wildflowers. Calcareous fen, as they're known, are some of the most diverse and productive systems in the world. Okay, that's the most naive. The second uh, most naive, a little more uh, uh, nuanced, is that these places can be understood as aesthetic objects and traced in their development with the development of aesthetic ideals. And then the third is that these places serve purposes. And I'll delve into that. But the purpose is that, that we see the Leechwort Spring Garden Preserve fulfilling, right? Our places for, for kids to explore, uh, to play, to connect with each other, the outdoors, and develop healthy lifestyles. For nature, to still have a place on this landscape outside of the backyard, outside of the birdhouse. Uh, these are red-winged blackbirds. And for native uh, flora, native fauna, uh, to persist in a landscape that is increasingly urbanized, as well as for elements of our history, our heritage, and our culture to persist. And right now, we have a phase one restoration uh, grant to support the improvement of the park uh, with DCNR and, again, county funds. Conservation needs conservationists. These two little girls were the, the daughters of, of tenant farmers who worked the Watercrest Farm. And we tracked them down, brought them back out, and we took down the no trespassing signs when we finally were able to buy the Watercrest Farm in 2018. We replaced them, of course, with signage that recognizes uh, our donors and invites folks to learn more about the Spring Garden Preserve. We also put up signage, right, so that folks just taking a walk, uh, enjoying time, out with family or away from family can understand what's happening in this place. We have cleanups. Uh, we control invasive plants. We pull garlic mustard this time of year. Helps to have more hands. Uh, this is the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Student Action and Restoration Project. 